Welcome to Slime House, a podcast defining a genre of outrageous hijinks, crude humor, and mild language. This week, we are thrilled to welcome a very special guest, writer, director, Brad Silberling. Silberling's first feature film was Casper, which we covered on our most recent episode. And in total, he has directed seven feature films, including Lemony Snicket's A Series of Unfortunate Events, City of Angels, and Land of the Lost. In our conversation, Silverling shares how he found himself leading the big screen debut of The Friendly Ghost and extensive details about the craft behind his body of work. With the level of detail Silverling was going into, I honestly could have listened to him for hours. It's a fascinating conversation for both filmmakers and audiences. Enjoy. Just to give you a little context, it, we yeah. have been tracking these specific kind of popular movies of children's movies and PG rated movies of the nineties and two thousands. And uh, you happen to have directed a few of them. So you popped on our radar as someone we might want to reach out to and ask some questions to. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. We call them the, the tonal tightrope movies, you know, I like that. That's a good name for it. <laughs> yeah. Wait, tell us, tell us more about that. What do you, how, well, you saw it, you saw the difficulty you had there and saying, well, children's movies. Well, no, family movies. Well, okay, that got really weird and racy. And then that got all of that. So to be able to try to please yourself and have the tone be truthful, get weird, actually land and get emotional, it's really a tightrope walk. And it's not easy. It's very hard in the testing process. Mm -hmm talk about a little bit but i uh, know my wife is always like going oh dude you picked another one because she knows it's going to be a really interesting ride to try to protect it and have it be what it's supposed to be to get to the finish line because four quadrant movies are always safest when there's really very few edges you know sharp edges anyway mm -hmm. very interesting all right, let's we, let's dive in. I think Jared, you've got the first question. So go ahead. Yeah, so we just cut an episode on Casper, and uh, we also strongly consider you know the Lemony Snicket is also on the docket for sure. But we wanted to start with Casper, and we were interested in like how you became attached to the project and uh, what the creative process was like in that, and then what was it like to be have one of your first movies be such a huge hit and well received. Uh, I'll tell you exactly how it came about, which is uh, Byzantine as things are. So um, I, when I got out of grad school, I went under contract uh, at Universal Studios. And they were the last, they hadn't even been doing it for years, but back in the 60s and in the 70s, they would do these term deals for directors. And Steven Spielberg was one of those. Dick Donner, there were a number of them, people who would go and sort of be under contract. Jaws, people don't know, was made under his first contract mm -hmm. still because they would kind of capture everything. They would capture your writing, your directing, your producing. If you made coffee, it's like, okay, it's on the deal. They, they got that. And so um, I, but my first opportunities ended up being, while I was off writing scripts at night, I ended up starting to do some television and cut to was about three years into the effort, um, I did a show called Brooklyn Bridge, which was a CBS show that Gary David Goldberg, who had done Family Ties, Gary uh, had created this awesome show, his period show. Anyway, very Jewish show, as he said, it was rather ethnic. And so they had a half hour to fill one night uh, after E.T. ran on the air for the first time because CBS had bought the rights to, to do it. It was a Thanksgiving thing. They were trying to make it a perennial. They needed to fill a half hour. So they reached out, they took the least, as as I can say this as a tribe member, Gary said the least Jewy episode. And they basically put it in after Steven's thing. And I got a call the next day from Gary laughing, said, well, you're gonna get an interesting phone call. My friend, Steven Spielberg just called and said, who did that? And so, <laughs> Steve, I can't even remember. He was finishing the end of post on, on, I don't even know what it was at that point, but he said, can we sit down? Um, and or his office said, he'd like to sit down with you. Can you come in in three weeks? I said, yeah, yeah, anyway. 
so Stephen was amazing because basically when I walked in and sat down with him, he came in, didn't even let me talk. He said, okay, let me tell you about your last three years. And I looked at him and he said, you're young. They think you're, you're cute, but they're not going to give you the trust. They don't want to do this. They don't want to do that. And he literally described my first three years under contract doing television. And it was amazing. And he said, I know. He said, I, I was under the same situation. I know. And I saw what I saw in the tube. I could see you were making a movie. You only had a half hour to do it. So uh, I'd love to do a longer one with you. So it was a remarkable. And it was only because he had literally lived the same experience that he had the courage or insanity to do that. So it wasn't Casper. He said, I want to give you a script, see if you respond to it and let's talk. And it was the most appropriate first movie. It would have been like a little $7 million, uh, like a Louis Mall film. It was about literally about kids and divorce. It was very bittersweet. It felt like a European movie, totally perfectly sized for a first feature. But it wasn't, it, it wasn't, remember, this was pre DreamWorks. It was Amblin, and basically everything was either at Universal or, or Warner's for the most part. So this was at Warner's. I worked with him on the script. He literally left to go to Poland to make Schindler's List. Oh, wow. I started to prep and I started running into hurdles. I couldn't get deals made. I couldn't get my DP's deal made. I couldn't get an executive at the time who's awesome, Lucy Fisher, who was like Stevens executive of Warner Brothers, I called Lucy and I said, I think something's going on. And she was really awesome. She was like the, she was like deep throughout the inside. You know, she said, I think you should call your friend. I don't think they want to make this movie and I don't think they know how to tell him. Anyway, so I called Steven in Poland and he called me back. Hey, how's it going on your first movie? Isn't it the greatest? Aren't you excited? Da, 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 da. And I said, ah, well, yeah, part of it's great, but I don't think, Lucy doesn't think they want to make the movie. It's like, what? Oh, it's crazy. Let me call them. I'll call you back. And he called me the next day. And it was amazing. And he said, you know, uh, yeah, it's true. They don't. And they didn't know how to say it. They said, they asked him, would you make, would you let your kids see this movie? And Stephen's like, I'm making this movie for my kids. It's about divorce. I'm a child of divorce. My kids have lived through divorce. There's a sense of humor to it, blah, blah, blah. They were very uncomfortable with it. He said, I don't know how to say this. I'm so sorry, but yeah. They, and I said, don't worry about it. <laughs> I'll go back to my day job. Um, and which was amazing timing because I, so when I was doing television, my home away from home, even though I was at Universal was Stephen Bochco's company. And I directed, he had a, he, his main director was a lovely guy named Greg Hoblet. Hoblet had seen my graduate film and said, come work. Mm -hmm. So I had done everything that they literally had over there. I'd done Doogie Howser, I'd done LA Law, I'd done you name it. And they had just done the pilot for NYPD Blue. So Hoblet called me, he said, I hear you might be available. And I laughed, I said, yeah, I think I might be. So I came in to do two of the first 10 episodes of that. It's where I actually met my wife. Oh, congrats. And, thank you, that worked out. <laughs> and. So while I was doing those, I did a pilot for Bochco and um, I had heard about Casper. Um, I think I had at one point, I think if I'd read a draft, I don't know, but I'd heard about it and they were making it um, with Alex Proyas, the Australian director. <laughs> um, and it's all I knew was it was happening. I was off in Hawaii doing this pilot when I got a phone call and it was a phone call from Steven and who basically said, okay, he, he, he's really good at this. Just jump in and don't want, you don't get to say anything. It's like, okay, this one's really going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> this one's really going to happen. And, and, and we already have a release date and, and I think we have a start date, which he muttered really quickly because it was insanely close. <laughs> and he said, and, and, and it's wonderful. And it's called, and I said, excuse me, what? And he said, it's Casper. And I, 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 I cracked up and I said, you know, you know who you called. <laughs> you, you made the wrong friggin, you know. And he said, no, I know. I said, you mean like, the?" Go he said, yeah, it's going to be, it's live action. It's going to be CG. You know, the, the 54 shots I did in Jurassic. Well, this is going to be. 
character. No, no, no. And I said, I, I think you're out of your mind. I, I dated an animator for like five weeks in grad school, but I, I'm not an, I don't know animation. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 and he, but this is where Steven's amazing. And he said, no, 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 no. He said, you're very technically savvy. What you do emotionally is what the movie needs. You're super proficient. You will figure the rest out. I didn't friggin' know walking into Jurassic. None of us knew. And we're still learning. He said, so it's going to be great. What he also didn't quite reveal was essentially there was very, there was barely a script. At that point. <laughs> <laughs> He's calling me right before Thanksgiving. In, in, uh, and this was 93. He's calling me right before Thanksgiving. And at that point, the start date was supposed to be the end of January. And because they were backed into a release date. And so I got back from shooting this pilot and just hit the ground running. But essentially it was one of those, I mean, talk about an Amblin movie. Listen, the, the tricky part about Jaws having worked so well and them writing it at night every night is that there is faith that it can happen. And so he's not stressed by that. Uh, a first time filmmaker is gonna be pretty stressed by that. So I had, we had two animation writers who were terrific, who came from doing Animaniacs. But I was writing, there's a woman named Malia Scotch Marmo from Boston who had written for Steven before. JJ Abrams, a buddy of mine. I had JJ locked in my trailer for the first three weeks of shooting. I was like, just, just go, take that sequence, do that, just go. And he was like, it was like old school. He was running into the stage <laughs> for me. Like, wow. Let's go. Um, and so it, it it was crazy they ha and and even on a even as i was finishing this pilot i was doing you know we we didn't have skype or zoom or any of that happening in 93 but i was doing these extended calls because we had to start building sets we had to do all this and what had happened to, to circle back to Proyas is he supervised a, a draft of the script and it came in and i I never saw it. Stephen was profoundly concerned. He thought it was, um, it, you know, the, the 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 obvious word dark, but he he just thought it was like ink 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 black dark. He just he he did not think it was going to be entertaining. He was worried about it, and that's all I got from him. And then that was confirmed by some other folks. So that's why they kind of went back to the drawing board, but they didn't want to abandon the uh, the cause. Um, Christina had already just in concept expressed interest. I talked to her from Hawaii. Oh, wow. I called Steven and I said, I think, I think I said, you know, Bill Pullman. And he said, I don't, he said, I, I know of him. And I said, the day after I get back, let's meet Pullman because I think Bill should do this part. And, um, and Steven was amazing. So we went and sat down and had this great meeting with Bill and Bill's a real character. Cause you, you see it when you see, he's like, oh, okay. <laughs> you know, but Steven, after the meeting, Pullman leaves the room and he looks at me and says, it's your film. What do you, what do you want to do? I said, I think it's him. And he said, great, do it. Wow. And so that was the experience for me. I also, it was a wonderful time because Steven was, um, the uh, Schindler's was Michael Kahn is amazing and Michael is so fast. So Schindler's had come, had come out or came, I should say came out shortly <laughs> after I got back home. Mm -hmm. But as I was prepping and then I was shooting the movie, he was just sort of doing a victory lap <laughs> for Schindler's where he was having to do press the Oscars. Sure. Every day he'd come in and he'd say, I think I'm still a little drunk. And I'm like, cool, don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> but it was just like having, it, you know, because I'll be honest, when 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 he asked me to do it, I didn't say yes immediately. I, I said, I can't tell you how much I appreciate this. Uh, let me take the weekend. Because in my mind, the, the beaches of LA are littered with first time directors who failed mm -hmm. or their pictures failed. It's just the truth. And in my mind, it's like, hey, if the movie works, fantastic, great. Steven's name's on it. It's great. If it tanks, it's not. It's not going to be him. It's going to be me. And I also was concerned about the Toby Hooper effect. Um, now, granted, Poltergeist was you know eighty one, eighty two, 
And I don't think Dick Donner had quite that experience on Goonies, but I think he had it a little bit. So I had always heard about those early cases where as a producer, Stephen was very hands-on. And I was worried about that and had a very honest conversation with him about it. Um, not accusatory, but just wondering what his expectations were because I didn't think it, I didn't think I would work well um, as a pair of hands as opposed to some, and he said, no, no, that's why I called you. I, this is, and he lived up to that. So he wasn't, he was on set the first morning for my first shot. He, like I say, he, he was doing all kinds of other stuff, but he would come to hide out from his office. He would come to play. I'd say, here, take this handful of, of pudding and throw it at Pullman right at his forehead. <laughs> Perfect. I need this light bulb to go perfectly through frame. Only a director knows how to do that. Can you do that? He said, yes, I can. And wow. So it was like having a, it was like having a Super 8 buddy on set. Um, but again, that was occasional. And likewise, through the post process, he, he was incredible. Oh, no, there's no ghost in there. We can even check from here. There. See? Pleasure to meet you, sir. So that's how it happened creatively. It was very seat of the pants. Mm -hmm. And then again, from the standpoint of the animation, yeah, as he said, the dinosaurs had to crash into cabinetry. They didn't have to do like soliloquies. Mm -hmm. And so it was a real incredible learning curve. Um, I had uh, Phil Nibbling, who's a wonderful traditional animator, came up from London from Amblimation, basically doing drawings on set. I would go and give him key poses and he would sit and put them on a uh, uh, on um, his computer to overlay them over a video feed, but just for the most basic scale and very rough staging. And I ended up, I mean, just, you know, that movie, The Post was two years. I ended up having to, to physically act out moment to moment every beat of that <laughs> after the fact. Wow. At ILM and down in LA, what we ended up doing was very thorough black and white lion lamb kind of sketch work. And then I spent three days a week up at, at ILM doing just turnovers and, and shot reviews and all of that. So it was it was pretty exhaustive. And he laughed, he, Stephen, three weeks and said, oh, man, if you if you had known what you were getting yourself into, you would have never said yes. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> But it was it was the perfect supportive first uh, experience, and you don't know how it's going to go. And so, yeah, the fact that it connected and that, um, I mean, we did a 25th anniversary kind of watch along or whatever the term is here, you know, and it was terrible. I had Pullman do it with me. I had to get him on Twitter for a day. He was like, oh, all right. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was fantastic. And it was awesome. And I mean, people, oh, my God, they came out with shit. They were like. You know, this final sequence in the picture with Devin Sawa when he comes and he's turned into, you know, cash. I and people saying that's when I that's when I knew I was gay. Um <laughs> I, it was my first sexual awakening. It was intense what was mm -hmm. going on. Wow. <laughs> but it was it, it, yeah. it was had that legacy. Yeah, I mean that's an, it's one of those like foaming at the mouth stories where you've got like the most, perhaps the most famous director of all time, shepherding you and 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 resulting in something that is still remembered, like you described, and you know, twenty five years later, lives well, on. For, for the studio, I'll have to tell you, it's interesting. It was a nail biter because there were only two phone calls that happened. One was he promised Sid Scheinberg, Stephen, that he would call him after I showed him uh, my cut. And, it, and he only told me why after he made the phone call. And he had promised he had promised Sid that he would call him to say, go for it, meaning they were going to unleash their marketing machine. Oh, yeah. The movie, but if the movie looked like a turkey, he was probably going to say, I'd wait a little bit or, you know. Something. <laughs> so he did that. And then normally, you know, the process with the studio, you show them the picture, they go to a preview, show them the final, essentially a lock cut. They saw nothing. They, they, we invited uh, Sid Scheinberg, Lou Wasserman came. Uh, there was a president of production at the time. They came over to Amblin and Stephen kind of pushed me 
in front of him and he said you talk it was awesome he was nervous and he and i said well okay normally be when i give you the rough cut speech but it's the movie we really hope you like it and we ran out of the room it was hysterical <laughs> i was like this is the movie we never tested it you how could you basically a good portion of the characters were missing until they weren't right so yeah it's like it was a watch yeah mm -hmm. and the only only he could have created the environment for that to happen wow yeah that's that's amazing it's amazing to get yeah so much out of that um and i guess i kind of want to I want to go with that and notice that of the seven films I have counted that you've directed, feature films that you've directed, um, four of them are adaptations of some kind. So you've got Casper, children's television show, and then the series of unfortunate events, Land of the Lost TV show, and then um, a remake of Wings of Desire. And I wonder, through looking at all those four movies that are all adaptations of very different types of material, of source material, as a director, what's your, and I imagine you work with writers certainly, but as a director, what, how do you start with something that is exists already and then bring your own life into it in a new format? So you have to realize, and I don't think I'm alone, we're directors are narcissists. We just are, meaning what I respond to, what I see in my head, I have to believe somebody else is going to enjoy it's an insane premise but it's the only premise that gives you the courage to go do what you have to do so wh when it comes to material that exists whether it's um you, you know novels or in the case of Bim's movie a, a, another film if there's something at its core and it's funny it can be an image it can be a theme it can be a, a line of dialogue or a piece of music that's suggested if there's something that resonates that I believe I can build on and that I I can see spending two years doing mm -hmm. and own and feel like there's a reason why I have a point of view on this that probably somebody else doesn't have. If I can do that, I like to think somebody's gonna agree out there. I mean, that's really what it is. And so adaptation work for me, if, if it were just sort of like Xeroxing pages and putting them up on screen, it would be a lot cheaper. <laughs> um, it's not. It's it's sort of like it's like reading a great book and two years later, closing your eyes and thinking, what stayed with me? What mm -hmm. moment? What what love scene? What unbelievably suspenseful moment? What stayed with me and why? And if something didn't, why? If there were too many characters, why? Well, three of them actually served the purpose of this one obstacle. So it's a, it's, I, it's a really enjoyable process. Um, again, you got to kind of firewall yourself, though, because when you take on, like, Lemony was sort of really hitting its peak, its stride when we were doing it. You knew there were going to be very, if you love, rabid fans, but you knew... Yeah, Later, what what Netflix did, it, it's funny, Netflix didn't exist, obviously, mm -hmm. when we made our picture in 2004, and Netflix was sort of perfectly served for doing a truly serialized version to make a feature that basically still had a beginning, a middle, and an end, and didn't just seem like so we had to go in. And that's why I loved having Handler involved, because Daniel's fantastic. He's so not precious about things. Mm -hmm wanting to chuck stuff i was like whoa, whoa, whoa wait a minute you know hang on <laughs> and but that but that's really what it is is you end up having to um still serve a story that's going to sustain 90 minutes two hours whatever it's going to be um but but that's that that's when i know something's a movie i want to make versus just a movie i'm happy to see mm -hmm. um is something has just pulled me and i was in london doing press on on the movie that i wrote on moonlight mile when i got the call from from dreamworks asking me to take a look at the books on lemony snicket and so i literally ran to what's it called hanley's i think which is this incredible it's like the fao schwartz of london oh yeah oh, yeah hanley's yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. hanley's hey. yeah and they so they were there they were even though it's hysterical because you know handler lives in san francisco but they seem so british those books 
And so I picked up the first three or four and I read them while I was there and just was floored because again, tonal tightrope, talk about tonal tightrope. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was so taken with his awesome bravado, his really wicked sense of humor, sense of intelligence. Mm -hmm. Is co that constant refrain from Klaus? Yeah, I I know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, balls! If they're gonna if they're gonna do this and commit to this, fantastic. Um, and then God, the movie, the, the books are a hit. So if anything, you have to kind of keep putting the audience in front of. Them. You got to let the audience fire while you between the movie and the studio because if the studio gets scared. It's like, here's your audience. Here's what they're expecting. I did that in, in prep. I brought a bunch of like 11 to 14 year olds into on a Saturday and videotape them. I did a town hall. It was like Joe Biden. <laughs> <laughs> I did a town hall with these kids in the art department. I wanted them to see all the artwork. I wanted to ask them questions honestly, so that I could take that video and give it to the head of the studio, Sherry Lansing, mm -hmm. to, to remind her this thing's going to get weird and dark and twisted, but that's what these kids want. So I would say, okay, we're making a movie now. This is not a book. You don't actually want to see Jim Carrey like kill somebody. You just want, and they were like, no, he has to, he has to. <laughs> <laughs> it's awesome. They were rabid. So that was me trying to inoculate the movie ahead of time. And we had to do that all through the process. And Jim and I would conspire on ways to try to protect it. But again, that's what got me. That's what hooked me. It's like, you know, it's the version of steal this book. It's like, you know, don't buy this book. It's the littlest elf covering for the truth of, mm -hmm. of what the movie's going to be. Um, and that's, that's, so that's got to be there for me to believe I can try to help shape it. Um, whether or not I'm working with another writer. Um, and, but you'll always see the rhythm. It's interesting. It's not a coincidence that I go from an adaptation to something I've just written. Because there's a moment where I just need to come back to, okay, <laughs> I, I, this is, I'm just going to come from, I, I don't need to, I don't want to negotiate on this one necessarily with an audience or negotiate with a studio. I just want to write this one, cast it well. And then, so, it, but it's a sinus rhythm. It goes both, it really, it, it switches off. I hadn't noticed, that's really cool. I, I hadn't noticed that. I mean, I sort of saw them all at, I, we watched a lot of them this week to, in prep and, um, and rewatched in some cases, but like I hadn't put that detail together. It's so. Not intentional. So I, it was pointed out to me by Elvis Mitchell, who's a buddy of mine, is really smart. Sure. Yeah. Read it. Elvis tells me everything about what I do. I'm like, really? He's like, yeah. Don't you realize that you did this and this and this? And I never, I didn't put that together. But of course, it makes sense emotionally. You know. So mm -hmm. that's that's what. Uh, yeah, just kind of building off of what you were saying about as a director, kind of turning the ideas in your head into reality. Um, something I've noticed about uh, your children's work in particular, Casper and Series of Unfortunate Events, is they have really amazing, very specific production design, really amazing practical sets. And I was just wondering sort of what your process was for world building through the use of practical sets. Yeah, it 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 comes from it, it comes from a love of design a love of photography um and it's funny you asked that question because for me that the first step is i have to just again dream it's like what is the environment that's going to set this particular obstacle off set off this particular whether it's humorous is what is that going to feel like i mean in casper the great thing was of course weirdly without being kitschy, we wanted to pay, we wanted to pay homage to, to, to the Harvey tunes, the feel Casper and his uncles were like squirrels. They were like soft serve in a way. <laughs> and, and then, and so I was going through books of photographs with Les Dilly, the designer, we were just looking at every Gaudi um, piece of architecture, most of them in, you know, obviously from Barcelona. And it just felt like that. I haven't seen that that feels like the the character feels like it's going to be both inviting and really twisted and then at times dizzying. Um, and so it was like, okay, let's do that. We have no time, but let's find a way to go do that. Um, and, and in each case, that's what the, there was a, there's a beautiful art photographer named Michael Kenna. Kenna was my main 
um, sort of point of reference on Lemony Snicket in that these very graphic, very essential images where it could be one dark tree in a sea of fog and and a plane of water that has no horizon, just one tree. I mean, it'd be like, I would say, and so often there's a, it, it's changed. If you know the store in LA, it used to be in Santa Monica called Hennessy and Ingalls, um, which is very funny because my wife, Amy, played a woman who worked at Hennessy and Ingalls in the movie Heat. And so I always make her say it to me because she has Southern accent. Hey, see any angles? But my, my ritual, my ritual, anytime I knew I was going to go off and get started on something was I go park myself in Hennessy and Ingalls for a morning. And it's sometimes searching out specifics. Sometimes it's just that great kismet of I'm looking and I'm and suddenly I, that's what happened to Michael Kenna. The first time I saw a, a compilation of his work, I was like, holy shit, that's it. And I, you know, bought copies, sent over to Rick Heinrichs, my designer. Um, and so it, 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 it can be both something you're searching out, you encounter, but it is that it's, it's photography, it's architecture, and it's not random. It's got to somehow, it's got to somehow support. It's like the most brilliant Bo Welch, who I had the great pleasure of working with the land of the lost. And Bo's genius, and he's the funniest guy. He's married to Catherine O'Hara. How can he not be funny? <laughs> and Bo did, you know, so many, so many of Tim Burton's pictures. And but one of the one of the films he designed that's so subtle and so genius, he did with my friend Alfonso Cuaron, which is Little Princess. Mm -hmm. And in Little Princess, besides just everything being green, which it is, and it's amazing, he just built the sets, he built the door frames proportionally to feel like what you would feel like if you were in her shoes in her age. So the door heights were completely unnatural and the dimensions were unnatural, but they were still just close enough to reality that you, it wasn't a cartoon, it wasn't Dick Tracy, it was, yeah. it was her experience. And so that's what you get into with your designer. And if you jam, you just have the greatest time because you're talking what's the essential, character core of this experience how can we visually create that and you go from there i think one of my favorite details in the reptile room the floor is that it's a tessellation or something of like that and i was i remember that is it escher or is that I, yeah. yeah yeah and that, yeah that was rick and rick's the most rick heinrich's the most um humble quiet he used to be bo's art director and he was like, can I show you something? Let me just see what you think. And showed me the sketch. And then he showed me where it was coming from. And I was like, oh my God, that's fantastic. Long story short, the Benz, a reconstructive surgery. But uh, yes, from my understanding, Peru is a wonderful place. Brave Sonny started here and approached the incredibly deadly Viper with single-minded determination. No, he's Count Olaf and that doctor is his accomplice. And this is the problem when you're making a movie. You kind of just want to make a movie about the floor, you know? <laughs> yeah. You want to do that. And it's like, oh, yeah, but I still have to... St it, it's it's a tricky part because you can kind of start to fall in love with your design and you got to still serve the story, but hopefully mm -hmm. you find a way to... Uh, but yeah, it, that whole set was ridiculous. And then you walk away from it for a week and a half because it has to get deconstructed to become the memory. So when Lemony walks through in his investigation and it's all become kind of overgrown and uh, those are big set turnarounds and wow, you build yeah. a schedule around those things. Um, and they're always a little heartbreaking because you just, you remember what it was. Yeah. <laughs> Only in the, on the film. Yeah, I have a picture uh, walking into the to the the burned out Baudelaire mansion the first time, and Rick, because Rick's awesome, Rick literally burned a set, not on stage, but basically burned most of that set and then brought it in. So all of it, it's not paint treatment; it's genuine. And I remember just walking in the first time and looking around, going, "Oh my god!" You know, it's just remarkable. And yeah, how am I not going to make a 15 minute movie about this. So it's hard. And that I want to also ask about your use of real locations. Cause in um, 
in Moonlight Mile and in An Ordinary Man, you have great use of these cities or towns and the you can feel the texture of them. And especially loved City of Angels because I live in LA and I know that diner that they, they eat at in there. And, and I love the downtown stuff. I, it's just your use of these uh, existing locations is equally fascinating. So just tell me about that approach of when these places already exist and you're capturing them. Yeah, if you're lucky, if you're lucky and your life allows for it time-wise, the best thing you can do, if you know, if you know Moonlight Mile, I knew I was setting it on the North Shore. Obviously, City of Angels, there was no question about it. Even my the picture I did, my little, I call it my neorealist comedy, uh, 10 items or less that I did with Morgan Freeman, I just knew the whole thing was going to take place in Carson. And if you're lucky, you you carve out time and you just go alone and just dive in and dive under. Um, I, in the case of City of Angels, which was interesting, I had, uh, the, Meg had a picture she was finishing that Cage was doing two movies back to back. So we had to wait to get started. And, and, and the studio was very worried I was gonna go off and make another movie and mess the schedule up and I said, I won't, but you got to buy me my designer for three months. And so Lily Kilvert and I, so I spent time alone and then Lily and I in my car spent a couple of months going through every little kind of nick and, and cranny we could and dreaming up, not just sort of making the city behave for us, but going the other way around, which is what's really there. How can we take advantage of that? shape that one sequence of course that's where that belongs that's where it should be and you you so it's reverse engineering but the best kind of reverse engineering um so i always tell young directors the danger of just you're a chapman and you've got your scene to do and you sit there in your apartment and you draw your figures and and what if it doesn't fit in the particular diner you go shoot in yeah. and what if and then you're sitting there with your notes and you're freaking out and what is the scene about again what's the obstacle what are the attractions go park yourself in a location and just see how it can how how can that that one horrible piece of design in the middle of the diner is perfect because if i sit back that's going to divide them in a way and they don't see each other yet and then suddenly they do and you you you, you gotta just open yourself up but you need time to do it Mm -hmm. And so that's my thing is if, if I can find a way to, to build time when I, when I wrote uh, 10 items or less, it was hysterical because it was, I knew that thing was going to be very, very low budget. And so I did, I just spent time down in Carson down to like, walking into the target and trying to talk this mop salesman lady into being in my movie and her thinking I was a freak, <laughs> but, but, it's, it's how you do it. And, and the same was true for Belgrade. I mean, Belgrade has got the most incredible texture and it's beautiful and, and ugly at the same time and the weather changes. And so I, I had a chance to visit uh, once. I had a chance to, I, I, it was a movie that I almost made several years earlier, um, but it had designed it with the production designer had done all this incredible stuff. We had a piece of financing fallout the same crew came back together to finally make the movie when we made it with, with uh, Kingsley. And, um, but I, if anything, I even knew the city more. And so I was able, yes, that one particular stairway yeah. is going to tell me everything about how this man owns this city, his bravado, his hubris, his, it, it's like that you're, you're really matching up locations with character. So when you have time, it's, it's the best. And, People don't, they just don't think about leaving that time or creating that time. Um, best money ever spent is getting your designer earlier and your cinematographer earlier mm -hmm. too. Yeah. Very cool. I wanted to ask about 10 items or less since you mentioned it. I recognize that as one of the first, the first movie to be released digitally before theatrically. Yeah. And we're in the age of Netflix where movies like The Irishman and Roma, a few others are coming out before like online for a theatrical release or yeah. at least very close to each other. Yeah. Um, so I want to ask how it felt to be sort of a trailblazer of that release strategy. Yep. 
watch me. I'm, I'm moving my key light in. I realize it's getting darker here, so I'm <laughs> going to move in my key light. Um, so yeah, I, I we knew we were going to be kind of in up against it, um, and we were meaning that at that point in time. So Clickstar, which was this company that Intel uh, was investing in, because they of course hoped that people would get what were going to be called ugh, entertainment PCs, or I don't know what it was, but it was basically going to be like a repository, like a DVR essentially. And so they wanted to invest in, in just like Netflix or, or Amazon, they wanted to invest in content so that then they could support their hardware um, sales. And we were the first film. And I remember asking the head of Clickstar, so what conversations have you had with the theater owners, with NATO? Who, what have those been like? And he looked at me and he kind of said, what do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> like, which told me everything. And I was like, oh, this is not going to be good. I said, you haven't connected. And he said, no, it's going to be fine. You know, we're not going to open until, you know, we're not going to go on the service until the third weekend. They're going to have like two whole weekends. In <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> so I I'm very active at the DGA. And I was on a DGA, I was in a DGA meeting with NATO on a completely unrelated thing a few weeks later. And there's a guy named John Fithy and he's a really good guy. And he's still like, I think runs NATO theater owners association. And we were just on speakerphone, but he said, Silverling, I hear you. I know you're there. And I was like, Oh shit. <laughs> and he's like, uh-huh. I know what you're doing. And I was like, uh. and yeah, it was bad. They, so essentially they put an arm up. Mark Cuban, because Mark Cuban is Mark Cuban and loves to sort of say fuck you to the world in terms of <laughs> he loved that we were pushing the envelope. And um, so Magno, uh, so he uh, agreed to um, have us, I forget where it was like premiering in, in Dallas at a thing and, and he supported us. And, but yeah, it was, um, it, it was very tricky. That that part of it was tricky. The, the the actual theatrical thing, and as you say, we were just at, we were just ahead of the curve. It's now I look at everything everyone's going through. I mean, the fact that we didn't go up on their site until the third week today would seem like glacial. It would just mm -hmm. seem, um, but it was about as fun of an experience as I've ever had because truly that, that was my first sort of independent experience in terms of just you go off and do your thing. Um, but it was, it was tricky. Um, and, and the hardest thing being it's, it's a little bit what filmmakers are feeling now. I was just with Julie Taymor, who's a friend last week, and she had a picture open called the Gloria's and it was opening on the Amazon. And she said, and she's never gone through that where it's a, it's a streaming release. And I said, I know it's a little bit like the sound of one hand clapping. It's like, you just don't know. You're not with people in their living rooms. You're not you're in a theater. You just don't know. And she's like, yeah, it's really lonely. And I said, I know it's hard. It's very, very tough for filmmakers. Um, but that is now the new normal, um, even more so in the last, you know, six months. So net, net, it was good. I, at the time I was only sorry, cause I really wanted, I was, I loved the movie. It was, I, we, I, I just, I, Morgan Freeman being light and Morgan Freeman just, just ripping on his own persona. Uh, as well as honestly, I, I'll be completely honest. I wrote that movie for Dustin Hoffman because I had done Moonlight Mile with Dustin. And, um, and so a lot of the inspiration for the sort of wonderful, naive narcissism in the movie is my friend Dustin. But it happens, Morgan's like, oh, yeah, I'm this guy too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A lot of celebrities in their bubbles. Yeah. So uh, moving on a little bit from some of those more technical questions, I kind of want to go back to something you mentioned at the beginning of the interview and kind of throughout about the tonal tightrope, because I, re I really like the way you kind of phrase that, because I feel like that's something we've touched on in this project, talking about these sorts of movies is, and I just want to know kind of, how do you approach these movies with, that are both going to be fun for kids? Because I mean, Casper, a movie I loved as a kid, and I feel like still resonates just as much with me today. Just movies that kind of balance fun and very serious sort of messages about grief and loss and those sort of themes. I think you, hopefully, I mean, even in an insane scene where like, you know, Will Ferrell's ripping on a, a T-Rex about his intelligence. <laughs> yeah. If 
if it's honest, whether that ends up becoming humorous in that moment, surprisingly emotional. Cat is worried that her her she's losing memories of her mother. Not that her mom won't remember her, but like she's already starting to lose specifics. If it's honest and it's truthful, usually you're on the right track. Um, it's just the idea that that it's not just one kind of French fry, that there can be different sizes of fries in that box. That's what's very unusual for studios, and it makes them worried. And you have to work extra hard because they're shaking the tightrope. They're like, ah, but, but, but. And, and you have to just kind of, and it's a lot of handholding. So you have, I mean, directors have to spend so much energy making a movie, but the amount of energy you need to make on a movie that is a tonal tightrope, huge part of it's expended in having to try to reassure, protect the movie. Don't let anybody make any really bad mistakes at times, threaten to quit. I mean, I, I'm mentoring a, a young guy who's a, already had a now a hit movie. It's great. I said to him, you're probably going to have to quit three times on any movie. And it's not just a mood. You have to be prepared to walk away because it won't be what it has to be. And usually that shakes them to the core. Because the only reason they ever hire directors is because they think you know something that they don't know, mm -hmm. which is true. And so it, it's 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 that. But I I believe, and again I come back because we're narcissists. I believe when I can watch a movie, I can watch Lost in Translation. I can be laughing my ass off, and then I can think that is the most moving, incredibly connected thing. What an incredible use of music there that services this feeling. All of those elements that um, it's just the bigger the movie, the more expensive the movie, the more challenging, because that's where, I mean, Land of the Lost, we we went in, it's kind of like my, my town hall meeting that I did for Lemony, we went in and had a meeting with the studio, because Will had had a movie called Kicking and Screaming. Mm -hmm. um, am I literally like a campfire story now for you guys? Should I? <laughs> You're I, good, I mean, are you, if okay? you want. Whatever you want, you're you're fine. Yeah, I think it looks. You look good. Okay, good. It fits with the vibe of Casper. It's, it's very there we easy. go. <laughs> um, Will had made um, a movie called Kicking and Screaming, and it was gonna. It was supposed to be like Bad News Bears, and the studio very late in the game suddenly marketed it and readjusted it to be just try to be a softer thing, and it was a nightmare. And he and his manager Jeremy Miller were always sort of. So we went in and had a meeting with the studio ahead of time and just said, we're going to point out five insane scenes and these scenes are never going to change. And this is what the movie is. And you guys all have to look us in the eyes and, and nod your head because if not, we haven't spent any money yet. Let's all go home and go find other things. But we really, really need to acknowledge the tone because the movie is like, it's, it's many things. It, but it it both I wanted it to to I wanted to respond to it from being the kid who grew up watching that show. I wanted it to be a guy, you know, it's like it's an also awesome stoner comedy. It's a crazy movie. And what it isn't is polite. And so it was tricky going because late in the game, when we had a studio executive say, Well, you know, our family audience, and we were like, Whoa, 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 whoa excuse me. And you, you, so, but, but that's, the, and it's not them being sadistic. It's them looking at the investment they have. They, you know, the minute you tell you it's, o, you know, it's OPM, it's other people's money. The minute you take other people's money on a scale that, you know, they got to double that return between marketing and everything and else, it's a lot of money. And so they desperately need to push out the, the, the returns and that's where they do. So as I say, you, you, you have to, so what I tend to do is communications, everything and directing talk to everybody early about exactly what the movie is going to be point to some specifics, which you think are what the movie at times rests on in its success, mm -hmm. help them. If there are often with these tonal, uh, tonal tight ropes, often, there's not perfect analogs. Hollywood loves an analog. They love to go, oh, yeah, yeah, it's like that. That was a hit. They often pitches. That's why you hear it's Jaws meets on Golden Pond or whatever it is. It's like, they they like that because they it's a defensible purchase for them. They can say to their bosses, well, he said it's going to be like this. And so 
it's hard when there aren't easy analogs. And, and in the case of a lot of these movies, they're really not easy analogs. I remember talking to, I remember talking to one of the two heads of the studio at Universal at the time when they were green lighting Land of the Lost and, and he was searching for analogs. And I said, well, you know, it, it's going to be hard for you. I said, but interestingly, if you go back in your own studio's history, do you remember the, um, you know, um, oh, good Lord, the, the two comedians who they put in all of their cl universal classic horror movies? Who am I uh, thinking? Abbott, Abbott and Costello. Costello. <laughs> so Abbott and Costello. I said, if you go back and look at the Abbott and Costello movies, what they did, which was genius, was they, they were the studio that made these movies. They had those sets, these textures, whatnot. But then they took the wrong people who should never be mm -hmm. in a scene with that with that monster and commit to that. I said, that's really what you're doing here. You're taking Will, you're taking Will's sensibility, his audience. You're taking a guy who you can enjoy being just a fucking jackass, but you, you'll you go with him because in the end you do. It's like, you know, he can be completely conceited, sexist. He can do all these things but it, it's on a big scale. All right, my murderous friend, take us home. Woo! Woo! Right that guy, right back there. Nice! Woo! Stick it. That's it. That's it. Oh, the horror! Oh, God, that is the coolest thing I've ever seen. Let's do it, pal. Woo! Maybe cool would be if he'd slide down Grumpy's tail just like Fred Flintstone would do. Woo! Oh, God. I've lived. And so that's, you know, so it, it's it's communication, communication, um, and then just really trying to hang on to it so that it doesn't go off the rails because of everyone's fears. I wanted to ask about one specific actor collaboration, one of our favorites, and that's Jim Carrey and your work with him in Lemonade. Tell us about working with that guy. Absolutely. So, uh, okay, I'm crazy. I'm a director. I'm just going to turn the light on. Just because. Sure. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm talking to you right now. Hang on a second. And I'm not just showing you movies. Just bear with me. Oh, City of Angels. Yeah. There we go. Okay. Um, so Jim, I had, I had only met Jim once really fleetingly at, at like a, 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 he got married briefly and I knew his then wife and I went to, to like a party at, at some point just to wish them well. And it was a crazy, I, I, anyway, we met for two seconds. So when I told, uh, DreamWorks that I thought, that I really like to do the movie. Stephen and Sherry Lansing set up a meeting for us. I always crack up thinking, oh, it's such a secret meeting. Well, meanwhile, it's at the Bel Air Hotel, you know, so they got a bungalow at the Bel Air because that's secret. <laughs> and Jim showed up with Jimmy Miller, his his partner, his manager. And um, Stephen was there and Sherry was there and Walter Parks was there. And so it was really just to talk about the movie to kind of, it was like a mafia arrangement. Like, yeah, we're all going to be, you know, we're all buying the hotels together. And, um, but I knew I needed to connect with Jim and I knew I needed to make sure that he understood why I, again, I knew something about his character that m maybe he knew or didn't really know. And that I could give him something to hang on to. And I said, you know, here's the thing about Olaf, man. It's like, honestly, he's any actor between jobs. And so if, and if nobody's going to cast him, he's going to literally hijack somebody so he can do his own Titanic. If they want to cast him the Titanic. And he looked at me and he was like, we're good. All right. <laughs> he got really excited about that because that, that to me is what Olaf is. Olaf is, is just amazing. It's like the guy just desperately wants to be an artist and wants to be, you know, sort of rec recognized for his artistry. And it's like, I mean, I can't tell you, we should, we, there's so many hours of footage, of course, in that movie that never made it to the screen, but I have, I have these acting classes that, Oh my God, they were incredible. Um, so, the, the, but 
but what I what I realized with Jim, Jim's amazing because nobody works harder. He, but is hard on himself too. He drills down. He'll he'll know how many steps he's taking going up the stairs before he turns. He'll rehearse things and 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 sometimes to you know you go. You, so what I realized with Jim was that I needed early on to make sure that a lot of the work that I might with another actor build in on set that I was going to build it in with him really early mm -hmm. because then his security comes out of, he knows exactly what he's doing. Uh, it's like, you know, listen, he came out of stand up too and stand ups, you know, they work these sets for months and months. They travel, they hone it, they refine it. And that's really what, what Jim's process is. And so what I did realize too early on was because the, obviously Olaf and all these incarnations were huge. And it's all on the the I don't know if it's if it's on the main DVD, it's on the Blu-ray, I think. But I just had this weird, I had a weird instinct, which was as we were trying each new look, normally when you do makeup hair tests, you um just roll the camera. It might be against a photo drop or it might be on one of your sets. You don't run sound, you know. I was still trying to figure out these characters, how they worked. Jim was so I, I asked my producer to have sound with us that day. At first I hated your bloody guts to pieces. Then I spent a month alone eating Reese's pieces. And I just stood by the camera and I started interviewing each of these characters. <laughs> Super random. What are your th what are, you know? Like to, to Olaf, what are your thoughts on on middle school education? Um, what are your thoughts on you know the economy in in Europe at this point? It's just like crazy weird shit. But just to hear him and to see what that character and Jim, he just ate it up because again, it gave him a chance to be those characters before the camera was ever really going to be on him later, mm -hmm. and he could find it and. In one case, so those things were those they were improv, total improvs, and they were incredible and they were so good. We we looked at each other as we finished them. We're like, that's in the movie, and that's in the movie, and that's in the movie. So we we went through and cherry picked these moments that were really key, and we put those into the script and we shot those. And much of these other characters in particular, they're they're the they came right out of the improvs. Oh, I guess he shouldn't order. But he drowned her in the water. That's when a flounder downed her. That's why they never found her. Biggest shark. The biggest shark I ever caught. Hey, that was me ex-wife's lawyer. Got his jaws all boiled and stuck up on a wall. She was lovely. French horn player. Constantly coming down with mononucleosis. You know, they're always sharing the instruments. Got it. <laughs> and there was one character that didn't work. Um, it was the, the original version, original version, and it wasn't the. It, it was as much the the whole look, the makeup, hair. It was it was too obvious, and that was. Um, oh my god! Uh, it was our wonderful lab, you know, the Italian, our Italian man. Um, oh, Stefano or Stefano in his original in his original incarnation came in and he almost looked like Mandy Patinkin in, um, you know, Princess Bride. It was like very swarthy, almost looked like a pirate. And it just was super on the nose, big Italian accent that wasn't quite right. It wasn't funny. Mm -hmm. And so I sat and Jim and I, we looked at all the dailies. And when that came up af afterwards, he turned around, looked at me and I, I just looked at him and I shook my head and, and, and he's very sensitive. So he came and grabbed me and we went outside. He goes, what, what, what? I said, I, I don't think that's it. Really? Oh my God. You, you don't, and it was like, no, I don't think that's it. And, and I said, I feel like it's what's expected. It's too on the nose. And, and he was really shaken, but he didn't disagree, but he just, it, it wasn't a spot he liked to be in. It was uncomfortable for him. So, and Billy Corso, who's genius, who won an Oscar for the, uh, all the uh, effects makeup, um was right there didn't say a thing and was listening so like two days later i can't remember a day later um 
I'm, I'm at this point now, at this, at that point, we had tested that character while we were shooting, I'm shooting and I get a AD call saying, Hey, can you go see Jim and Billy in the trailer? And I walk in and they had just taken the Olaf wig and done this horrible comb over. <laughs> and he turned around. He's like, hello. And he was, and he was doing a dude from uh, Nat Geo a very specific to, and I screamed. I was like, yes, that's, <laughs> oh, I'm Stefano. I am an Italian man. You know, like, <laughs> that is genius. It's genius because like, what a weird choice for, for him to make. He's working with what he has. He's not just suddenly, and it's so offbeat. I, I It's still one of my favorite characters in the movie. It's incredible. And it just came, but then he looked at me, he's like, can't do this. I'm like, yeah, we can. Absolutely. That's what we gotta do. <laughs> so yeah. And so then we put that guy on film and I did the same process with him. These, like I said, these are all somewhere on, on the, um, on the Blu-ray. I think they're really funny. And that's where, that's where the stuff comes from. I am uh, Stefano. I am an Italian man, and uh, I am here to assist him in his uh, research uh, as best I can, as well as to uh, facilitate and uh, remain observatory. I don't want you to think that I'm all business either. Uh, I, I can have fun. I can be fun. On a, on a long trip, I can be a lot of fun. <clears throat> do, you, do you play uh, cribbage? So we had a I had a great experience with him. Um, and again, it's trust and collaboration actors to put themselves out there the way they do. And again, I'm married to one. So it's like, they just, it's trust. And if they know that you're not going to literally let them hit the ground, you're not going to let them look super stupid, um, that you care, that you listen and that you have confidence, it's everything to them. And then they'll go there with you. Um, but you you gotta you gotta be consistent and you can't be political. You gotta you you need to give them reason to have faith in you, really, is what it comes mm -hmm. down to. And so um yeah, adore him. Had a had a great experience. So cool. Yeah. Speaking yeah. of actors, um we wanted to talk about the the scene in Casper where Bill Pullman transforms into a bunch of different other actors. So you got Clint Eastwood, Rodney Dangerfield, Mel Gibson showing up in one scene, then Prior to that, Dan Aykroyd shows up and reprises his role as a uh, one of the ghost. Yeah. and Don Novello, who was um, was Father Guido Sarducci from back in SNL, you know, that, that's the way. <laughs> amazing. So we were curious, like, what was it like to secure such big names for for those kinds of roles? Um, it it really depended on depended on who it was, and it depended like Novello and and Aykroyd were awesome and just got it and and it was not like having to sort of offer your firstborn super fun great just got, got the gag it was going to be a you know morning of work it was gonna be like that but when we were talking about the the transformation scene the morphing scene um we got really i mean steve and i were talking we got really excited about clint we got excited about mel gibson rodney there's the crypt keeper um and he was he was he had a really good relationship with clint he's like i don't think he'll do it unless i call him i think i gotta call him and i and then he and i looked at each other and, and it was really funny and we both knew he was like yeah and he's probably not gonna do it unless he thinks i'm doing it too <laughs> <laughs> i think you're right and i think that might even be true for mel and it might be true for so that is what we did. So he did, he called Clint and Clint was fantastic. Clint came over because you forget Clint Eastwood started as a contract actor when he was doing like, you know, not the big spaghetti Westerns, but other stuff. And he started at Universal. So we were on stage 12, which is gigantic. And it's where we built the house. He's hung out all morning, just telling stories and wow. um, could not have been more sweet. But sure enough, the old Dr. Harvey Brown sweater, there's Clint, there's, you know, Dangerfield, there's the... And there's Steven too. Steven had to put his on. <laughs> and I shot him last. But I I we definitely planned to shoot it just in case. So he wouldn't feel like he was completely fibbing. Um and I and and he was fantastic. He was super nervous. Who isn't? Because directors were not really actors. And I just kept feeding him like 
lines to things to yell out and including he famously is bonnie curtis who's a great producer now but bonnie was his assistant then if you were anywhere in the building you would just always sit down when you hear bonnie <laughs> so i had to like call up for bonnie like for his mom um so we shot that and then you know we were never gonna, the footage exists somewhere but we were never gonna really use it and i don't even know if he ever <clears throat> Told them why he was cut out of the movie, <laughs> but, <laughs> but it was great. And yeah, the each of them very different, super easy. Brought them in, pitched different things. Some, you know, we went with a pure visual with Mel Gibson, really enjoying his handsome face. It was. <laughs> I'm gonna kill you, your mama. Now we're bridge playing friends. You think you got it tough? I got a facelift. There was one just like it underneath. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> of course, the, that was the funny thing was the thing that took the most time and they were the sort of most precious was the Crypt Keeper. I'm like, dudes, come on. Put <laughs> over there. He came in and it's like, no, well, what about what? Anyway, <laughs> that's awesome. Mm -hmm. The first time I saw that, I didn't know that the Crypt Keeper was like a property from something else. And, yeah. I think, and that's what I remember from my first time watching it as a kid. Just like that scene, the Crypt Keeper's presence scared me. Super creepy, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah no, because I was not a huge Tales from the Crypt guy, but anyway, yeah. Mm -hmm. good. Indeed. Um, and if we can ask for one more kind of story with an actor, um, I, I am a huge Nicolas Cage fan, so I was curious what that was like. Oh man. Again, um, every actor, the beauty is, you know, everyone is different. Everybody's process is different. Um, he's so intuitive and that's the thing I loved about it. We met and he's a really gentle soul and we met and got very excited about doing the movie together. But then he, he literally was going to go do con air and face off and then be free um and so the only interesting challenge i had was by the time he finished those and i i made a point of staying in touch i went to visit him when he was working with john woo one day and just would kind of keep him in the loop show him some of the wardrobe designs and everything i could just to kind of at least keep him in the fold um but it was a really interesting curve because when we fit when when he finished those movies and had to come right into shooting it took a few days because there was a part of him that was still doing a Bruckheimer movie, you know? <laughs> and so the sort of incredible openness and vulnerability of his character, because he's not seen by anybody, wasn't quite there. And he, it, we had a really beautiful talk about it much later because he came in without proper rest, without being prepped and was, was, suddenly insecure about what this part was going to be and so it was really an interesting challenge for a few days he is purely intuitive meg is um incredible very smart meg meg loves the mechanics of writing she likes to break down a scene and nick is i mean they could not be more different so yeah again you're you're kind of different approaches for different things. Nick, Nick could, you know, if I was watching a piece of playback, Nick could watch and zero vanity. He just would sit and be fascinated and look at it. Like he was truly watching another character, not himself. Hmm. And um, just warm, funny. We're like the same age. We realized we, cause he grew up in LA as well. We realized we grew up watching the same like monster rally show, you know, on certain mornings. And so uh, again, great story collaborator, um, which is, I think, the biggest compliment I can ever give an actor is why I love working with Ben Kingsley. If they feel like they are your story collaborator and that that's the, those are the terms you're using together. It's like, ah, let's hide, let's hide the reveal in this scene if we can. How late can we hide that reveal? Um, they love it because you're not just giving them bad results to play. Be mad. You know, they're, they're, they, they know they've got a, an objective and an attack. Um, and so Nick, yeah, just really, really couldn't have been more wonderful. And again, Megan, he's so different and they just adored each other. It was sweet. I feel like each one of these movies, I could ask you hours and hours question, <laughs> but we want to respect your time. Um, 
So I just have, uh, I have one more just kind of sure. fun question and that's in both Land of the Lost and in City of Angels, there is a direct reference to Ben and Jerry's ice cream. Coincidence or, or no? <laughs> Coincidence. I, I, I would be the first to tell you if I'm like Jerry, yeah, Ben and Jerry's obsessive. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm not. See, you're being Elvis Mitchell now. I, I hadn't put that together. Uh, no, not, not that. That I think you've landed on on the the joys of of my seventh grade drama teacher would call it a. Oh, she had this great term. It was an imagination exchange. So <laughs> it means a coincidence. Uh, so no, no. I wasn't right. sure if it was like a New England connection or something. I don't know. I, but no, you know. no. But what I'll tell you. It's funny because where I thought you were going to go the New England thing, and I'll I, I but I'll never reveal where. So I um, spend if I'm lucky three months a year, four months a year on Martha's Vineyard of a home there, and I have um, that landscape always speaks to me, which is why the very opening shot in uh, Moonlight Mile, which is this very sort of odd surreal shot of this swimmer, oh, yeah. and then Jake walks around that State Beach. Um, in Martha's Vineyard, the beach, there's, there's a reason why the feeling of that shot is so like, wait a minute, I've been here. It is where all of Jaws was shot in terms of all the, the beach the beach attacks. And um, But on that island, there's a small town called Menemsha and Menemsha has a has a, uh, a buoy. And the sound of that buoy is incredible. It's in every movie I've made. I, I hide it. Whoa. <laughs> all so, right. Yes. That's a great little Easter egg to look for. It's a little more, a little more obvious in Casper, I will tell you that. Uh, it's right at the top of the movie because we're trying to set locale in a really hard way, but the rest of the movies, it's very unexpected. So. But Jim Ben and Jerry's, now I have to put it in every movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Great. Well, Great. just one last thing. Do you want to tell us what's next or what you're working on in this odd time we're in? Was yeah, it right. Well, I can tell you, again, when I've gone back to, to grad schools, uh, even not during a pandemic, the, here's the beauty of writing. The beauty of writing, when I was a kid, I was a soccer player and they used to show us these movies where, where Pele would practice on the beaches of Brazil with a grapefruit. And it was like, that's all you need is a grapefruit and you can be a great soccer player. And um, it's the, the beauty of writing is I can have this lovely computer. I can have my, you know, my stack of napkins. I don't need a soundstage. I don't need a wonderful actor who's going to cost me $15 million. I just have to be alone with my imagination. And thank God for the ability to, to do that again between periods when one is shooting. So I, I don't think Elvis is wrong. There's a reason why if I finish something exhaustive, I love going into the bubble and, and writing. Um, so I've actually written a, a new film that I'm in the midst of just speaking to actors about trying to um, put together. Um, it's it, it's probably more along the size of like Moonlight Mile in terms of uh, its scope. It's not a it's not a big design movie, and yet Sense of Place this will be one where the location and the sense of the reality of the location is very very specific. Um, so I'm working on that. Um, but yes, the pandemic is strange. We, you know, used to be you'd go in and pitch a movie, pitch a series in the room, and now it's all done on Zoom. So mm -hmm. in the pandemic here, I, I, uh, I'm working on a limited series that'll be on now. It's Paramount Plus. It used to be CBS All Access um, doing a, a piece, actually, a uh, pretty amazing piece, uh, all true, two brothers who were uh, very different um, they were both FBI agents at the heart of the DC sniper case back in 2003. And the Bureau was not allowed to really take lead on that. And they went rogue because they knew that things were going to just completely become a shit show. Wow. So that's a very gritty, but really, really wonderful inside view of what it is to be, you know, I keep saying to them, it's a land shark. It's like, what was it to be in that community? And you just didn't know, 
moment to moment where you were and if you were going to suddenly be taken out and there was no over there it was all right here so um so working on that and then i've i executive produce uh my my show jane the virgin finished last year which we loved i've got two other shows on the air so those those i keep a, a busy eye on as well but um again it's been a, it's been a really incredible writing time very hard for some people a lot of my friends who are writers with all the concerns and the anxieties it's uh, it's been very distracting for a lot of people and so a lot of writers have beat themselves up thinking i can't do it it's not coming um so uh, you have to be patient and give it room but i've it, it's been productive in that way for me too so that's that's kind of what's coming yeah well, glad you're, you've been productive so. yeah yeah, yeah. Brian. Well, thank you so much. You've been very generous with your time. Yeah, really you so much. cool to hear some amazing stories. And really no, my pleasure. my pleasure. I, I love it. Oh, good. So you guys, and you got some Casper on the way. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So. Fantastic. Okay, guys. Awesome. Great to meet you. Yeah, it was great to meet you. Thank you yeah. so much. Thank you so much, sir. You bet. Take care. my greatest moments in the theater. It was the last scene. I was just about to make my escape. And I was waving my sword. And I was about to say the final line, I am the Scarlet. And then that cell phone. <laughs> I'll never forget it. I launched myself from the stage at his throat. I was taken to prison. I spent five years with a man named Bubba. He taught me everything I need to know about pain. And I draw on that now. I draw on that pain. <laughs>